party. Okay. Um, so what we're doing here uh, is this is our virtual internship uh, immersion program uh, presentation on the medical anthropology of the, An of the Andes. Um, this project team created a, a slide deck that showcases the daily realities of indigenous Andean communities and specifically calls out traditional medicine, nutrition, mental health, and other aspects of well being um, in the Andes Mountains. This team uh, worked with uh, several, several uh, parts of our Poch uh, family, uh, several, several members of our Poch family, including our Fibu Span family as well. There was a lot of background. Uh, uh, there was a lot of background uh, uh, presentation and information shared by our friend Wilson Rosales and and other members of our team. So we want to give a, a big thank you to Wilson as well as Mario Fuentes for all the background that they gave. Um, so please, uh, maybe starting at the top with Ivani, could you please give a, uh, a little presentation of yourself and pick the next person? Totally. Hi, I'm Ivani Nuga. I'm a rising sophomore at Princeton studying molecular biology. Um, I took on this internship just because I wanted to see if I was interested more so in the public sector or the public health sector of medicine um, and to also see if there was various just research topics I'd be interested in um, taking part of later on in my junior and senior years of college. Um, so yeah. I think next up is Lawrence. Hi, everyone. My name is Lawrence, and I'm a rising junior at Princeton University studying ecology and evolutionary biology on the pre-medical track. And I came across this internship through a Spanish course of mine and learned about the organization POCH through, through the same class that I took. And I decided to take on this internship to deepen my cultural understanding and immerse myself with Ecuador and the population that we serve and also to see what other fields there are within the healthcare field and what types of avenues I can take as a pre-medical student. I believe next up is Pooja. Hi, my name is Pooja Tawari and I'm going into my second year of my Master of Public Health program at the University of Texas at El Paso. And the reason why I pursued this program is because my interests lie in international health and I wanted experience specifically in global public health in Latin America. So next up for me is Tristano. Hi everyone, I'm a rising junior at Princeton as well. I'm studying psychology with a certificate in neuroscience and I came across this internship while applying for other ones uh, in the IIP program. And this one really caught my eye because when I met with Zach, he kind of said that this, inter this internship can really be what you make, what you want it to be. And you can go along with your interests or even just come, come across new things that you don't, like that you don't really come across while studying at Princeton or in subject courses. So I decided that it was a great way to get my feet wet and get a taste of everything. Next is Cody. Hey, hi everyone. My name is Cody. I'm also a rising junior at Princeton University and I am studying molecular biology and also on the pre-med track. Um, I applied to this internship because I thought it would be a really great opportunity to get to continue to explore Latin America. I had worked with, with um, in public health in Latin America before, but this one, uh, I felt like we really expand my knowledge about it because it works for different target audiences and in a different country too. Um, and so it's just, I think another step towards um, learning more about what I want to do in medicine and in public health, so. Yeah, and before we begin to, I'd just also like to, to commend the, the participants. You know, we, we call it an immersion program because of just because of the intensity of just jumping right into uh, this, uh, this, these themes that are so new to these students. They've never really been exposed to something like this before. Um, none of the students have, have been to Ecuador, and um, it, this couldn't have been possible without our collaboration with our team. Uh, virtually uh, via you know via um, emails via Zoom messages via WhatsApp and it was a really uh, amazing experience and uh, 
over these, you know, a little over seven weeks, the, uh, all of these participants really dove into this uh, project and uh, and the four others that are coming this week. So uh, I highly I highly commend you guys for your efforts. And um, Lawrence, uh, I'll I'll let you take take charge. <laughs> yes. So let's get started with our slide deck then. Are you guys able to view the screen that I shared? Perfect. Okay, so our, our slide deck and our final deliverable is basically an, um, a look into the medical anthropology of the Andes, especially the indigenous population that reside within this area. And I believe Avani would start us off with an introduction to this people. Yes. Um, so to begin, we'll start with some background history of Ecuador and how it shapes our status quo. So before the 1400s, the native people of Ecuador grew maize, beans, potatoes, and squash. However, they were conquered by the Incans in the 1400s and the Incan ex empire expanded throughout the Andes. In 1534, the Spaniards arrived and conquered what is now Ecuador. Within the same year, the Spaniards founded the city of Quito and Guayaquil a year later. The spread of the Spanish Empire brought about the spread of diseases such as smallpox that many natives had no resistance to. And I think it's estimated that around 7.7 .7 million Incans died from the spread of disease, specifically by the, from the Spaniards. Um, the Spaniards owned large estates and the native people worked as serfs. The Spanish also introduced slaves from Africa, which gave a rise to a colonial social hierarchy that included the Peninsulares, the Creoles, Mestizos, Natives, and finally the enslaved. And this still has discriminatory implications in Ecuador to this day. Um, in 1822, the area gained independence from Spain and was part of Gran Colombia with Colombia and Venezuela. In 1830, Ecuador became an independent country and was named after the Spanish word for equator. Oil was then discovered in 1967 and it soon became Ecuador's main export along with sugar, shrimp, and cocoa. And this led the economy to prosper, but in 1980, the price of oil fell dramatically. And when a country is so dependent on oil for its economy, it felt like it fell into a recession and a period of high inflation and high unemployment. And we see this today with Venezuela. Um, but now in the 21st century, poverty in Ecuador is declining, but there's still a large wealth gap and tourism is also a vital identity and a fast growing industry in Ecuador. Um, Ecuador is geographically diverse, which brings rise to various cultures and identities to various regions. For example, the Pacific Coast or La Costa has very warm and humid weather. Popular foods are ceviche and envocados. Tourism is popular along the Ruta del Sol, as well as whale watching and beaches in Montanita. The Andes or La Sierra has very unpredictable and high altitude climates. Common foods include ornado, fried fish, and chicken, or pollo. Tourism thrives in the high paramo and urban cities such as Quito and Riobamba. For the Amazon, or El Oriente, the weather is very tropical and rainy. The major foods are grilled fish wrapped in maido leaves, chica, yuca, and chontaduro. Tourism is popular in wildlife reserves such as the Yasuni National Park and as well as community tourism organized by indigenous communities, um, which is a vital part to, to some tribes' um, economies. And lastly, we have the Galapagos or the Islas Galapagos, which are diversity rich islands that are part of Ecuador. Um, some aspects of living conditions in Ecuador are comparable to developed countries. For example, the life expectancy of a person in Ecuador is 76 years. An average of 2.4 children are born to every woman in Ecuador. 21% 20 per, of Ecuadorian population live below the national poverty line compared to 64% in 2000. And the reason that there's been such a sharp decline in poverty is because the government has been focusing so much on infrastructure, which has given rise to better living conditions in general, as well as more jobs. And thus the unemployment rate has dropped to 5.4%. 
um, the literacy rate is 94.4% and 13% of Ecuador's population has a disability. The government has been trying to bridge the gap for people with disabilities, but it's been a slow process. Um, for example, if someone is handicapped, it's very hard for them to just travel around a city, especially through public transportation. Um, and disability is just a part of medical anthropology that's often overlooked. So it's something important to consider. 77% um, of Indigenous children live in impoverished homes with a daily income of $2 or less. Doctor to patient ratio is very low, uh, 1.72 doctors to 1,000 people. And 7% or about 1.2 million of people in Ecuador don't have access to basic drinking water. And according to the government, 100% of Ecuador has access to electricity. Um, we will go more in depth about various health conditions later on in this presentation, but an overview of some unique ones in Ecuador include Laurent syndrome, which is a condition of dwarfism, as you see to the right, um, in remote cities of Ecuador, where people don't grow past four feet. People affected by Laurent syndrome have lower insulin resistance and no rates of cancer or Alzheimer's, which is why many medical researchers in Ecuador have been studying their biomarkers to see if we can find possible cures to universal diseases such as Alzheimer's or diabetes. Um, oil contamination is another medical condition. The unregulated oil exploitation in northern Ecuadorian Amazon region leads to toxic compounds released into the environment. Um, a large majority of people living in the Amazon region have no access to drinking water distribution systems, and they usually collect water from the rain, wells, or small streams. Um, the concentrations of major ions, trace elements like nitrogens, pHs, and BTEXs were analyzed in different water sources. And the next slide has a graphic that shows the cycle of oil pollutants entering the drinking water in the northern Ecuadorian region. Um, and as you can see, the contamination happens both through the air and the ground, especially when you're collecting rainwater or you're pumping up water from wells. And the next slide has a graphic from Dr. Vargas's research that investigates the medical conditions that arise due to oil contamination in water. Um, and the most common problems that arise are cancers in the stomach, rectum, skin, soft tissue, and kidney, as well as leukemia in children. So I would say oil pollutants for, um, for water contamination is a major health condition in Ecuador or a health problem in Ecuador. Okay, so continuing on a sort of introduction to the Andean indigenous population. Uh, I just wanna mention, first of all, that uh, the word indigenous is start here because it's sort of something really hard to define. Um, you know, the official number that I've heard being thrown around that is like 10% of Ecuador considers himself indigenous. You know, not, it's really hard to you know, define what is indigenous. And so, at least for my sections, for the purpose of my section, uh, it, our research focuses on indigenous populations, rural populations, and even mestizo populations. Um, those terms should not really be synonymous, but as far as our research goes, that is what the case is um, for now. And so, the first question that I want to ask is, you know, what is health? And in a certain in a research survey. Uh, rural population of Ecuadorians were asked this question and you know these are some of the responses. They say my health is everything. Without my health I cannot work and take care of my family. I need to be able to work every day in my work. If I do not work I do not get paid uh, because they don't have sick days. They have to constantly they have to work in order to get paid in order to support their family. Uh, I have to work every day. I have to care for my family. I must stay well to do this. Um, even if you work for the city or in a business, you have to be at work to receive pay. I have been with the city for 10 years. When I am sick, I go to work anyways. Most of us do because we cannot afford to miss a day's wage. And so clearly the uh, Ecuadorian society does not necessarily support sickness well. Uh, you know, you have to be in good health to be able to support your family, to be able to earn a living um, and, and as such. 
And so more specifically, when asked what the significance of your health is, one person replied, the significance of my health is like asking the significance of my being. And so you can see here that health is very, very important to these people. It's, it, it's they, they say that if they don't have health, then they're not really living because they can't. Um, my health means that I am well. I am not sick and I can go to work and care for my family. Some people are not well. They are sick all the time and their families suffer. God has blessed me and my family with health. It means that we are healthy in our bodies and in our minds. To be healthy means to have a well-balanced life. Our minds and psyche are very much a part of health. If you are suffering in one of these areas, you are not your best. And so, as you again, as you can see, the sickness, they are sick all the time and their families suffer. You know, if one person is sick, then it affects the whole family. It's, uh, it affects the whole ecosystem of, of the family dynamics because a lot of these uh, indigenous communities, rural communities, they all live together in a large family and they all try to support each other. So if one person is sick and not feeling well, then it affects everybody. Next slide, please. And so from the last quote, um, they said, our minds and psyches are very much a part of our of health. And to be healthy means to have a well-balanced life. And so that is, a large part of the Andean cosmovision. And so I'm going to throw a term out there called summa causa, which is a, a Quechuan term. Uh, it's translated in Spanish to mean uh, buen vivir or vivir bien, or in English, good living. Um, also, as a side note, there is some discourse about whether those terms are actually synonymous based on how they have been used historically and politically. But again, for our purposes, they're going to be the same thing. Um, and so a very simple description of summa causa is, uh, is a way of living and a way of living well. And so on the left di diagram, it's, it has three terms, uh, la naturaleza or nature, la persona or the person, and el, uh, la sobrenatural, which is uh, extra natural things. And so what that falls under is the stars, uh, uh, gods, saints, natural forces in the sun and the earth, and of course the Pachamama, which is a uh, mother earth in the Indian um, tradition. Nature includes climate events, plants and animals, and of course there's the person, the individual, man and women. Um, and so the equilibrium between all three of these is, is critical in Andean cosmovision. Uh, and Andean Cosmovision is all about equilibrium, all about balance, a balance of giving and taking from each of these three sectors. And so to get a little bit into deeper detail in the person itself, there's also another balance, a balance between the body, the spirit, and the soul. And so the body, of course, is the physical being, and the soul is described as what life is. The soul gives rise to thoughts, uh, sensibility, and movement. And what the spirit is, is that it's it's not, the spirit is a little bit more hard to define, but it is something that it was described as not causing life nor death, but it is a complement to the body and the soul to maintain bodily control. And it, uh, it's been described that if you sort of lose your spirit, then it causes sickness. And I'll get into more detail about that because one of the sicknesses is as a result of having like what's described as like a weak spirit or losing your spirit. And so, yeah, so obviously equilibrium and balance is really important in these. And so the next question is, what is illness? So if you can go to the next slide, please. And so as we described, illness is the sort of imbalance between these things. And so another study asked, people, what sort of common, what sort of illnesses did they have? And so we're describing into two categories here. Some common illnesses are things that we've heard before, you know, coughs, cold, sniffling, sniffling, uh, cold was, colds were described as a lot in these studies, amoebas and parasites from perhaps dirty drinking water, upper respiratory infections, diarrhea, food poisoning, and then viral infections such as dengue and malaria. Uh, tonsillitis and pharyngitis, and then certain chronic diseases, especially with age, such as diabetes, gastritis, hypertension, high cholesterol, and asthma. 
And then there's also another topic called what we're going to call folkloric illnesses, which are illnesses that uh, indigenous communities believe exist, such as mal de ojo, mal aire, uh, and such. And so even if they are called folkloric illnesses, uh, there is a well-documented description of what these diseases are. And so they have causes and they do have symptoms. For example, mal de ojo is when someone gives you an, a really intense gaze or like a gaze of like hatred. And this is the disease that I was mentioning earlier that says that if you have a weaker spirit, then you're more susceptible to someone else's gaze. And some symptoms include fainting, nervousness, pale face, headache, diarrhea, vomiting, fever. And especially in children, there's also asthenia, which is a sudden loss of energy, constant crying and crusting in the eyes. Uh, another example uh, called susto is an emotional shock from animals, from a fall, a near drowning or an accident. And this disease is when the spirit separates from the body because of this shock. And uh, they say that symptoms get worse over time if you don't seek treatment. And some symptoms of these include body aches, insomnia, restlessness, crying, fear of loud noises, uh, thirst, and green stools. Uh, you know, there are a bunch of other ones. Um, for this, another example is mal aire or mal del arco iris. And both of these are being sick from walking in certain areas. So for example, mal aire, it, it could be bad air from walking around a cemetery or an area with cold air. And mal del arco iris is actually walking near a rainbow or some solar spectrum effects in stagnant waters. And they say that this disease more, effect, more likely affects women. And so, you know, there's a really large spectrum of diseases that we see here, diseases that maybe we are more familiar with and have like a more scientific basis on in such common illnesses, but also folkloric illnesses where perhaps we may not think that these exist from our perspective, we may not think these exist, but people have, but people know what causes these, what symptoms there are and, and the such. And so next slide, please. And so, you know, how do these people go about curing these, these diseases? And so in one study, there was a citation given that said 43% of Ecuadorian citizens who are sick prefer to use these traditional practices. Uh, and more statistics include the WHO, although they don't have specific statistics on Ecuador, uh, they do have some on neighboring countries, Colombia and Chile, they estimate one to 19% of the population uses indigenous traditional medicine well, the highest was Bolivia with 60 to 79%. And so clearly this is very widespread and very much used. And so what are some of these um, treatments? And the table down here shows that drinking herbal tea is actually one of the most popular ones. And so next slide, please. And so this is a lot to look at, but all I wanna say about this is that there are a lot of different plants and herbs that can be used to make teas um, or pastes or powders. Um, and they have many different functions too. And so there's some of them are more familiar, such as cacao, paya, um, a bunch of these I have never heard before and I don't know what these are. There's also orange, yerba luisa on the top right. It was stated to be very, very popular, especially for nerves. Um, but yeah, it, and if you go to the next slide too, this is it's just like another, it's the same table of lists of teas and leaves that people use for treatments. And what I, all I want to say about this is that there are a lot of different functions for these and a lot of different uses for these. And what I want to point out is that there is, despite these being called folkloric illnesses and folkloric treatments, uh, especially with ingestion of leaves and teas, it actually has been shown to be helpful because you know this is what medicine is, is ingesting certain chemicals, natural chemicals to help alleviate symptoms or alleviate pains. And so another, if you go to the next slide, please. However, there are also other treatments where people can go to what's known as curanderos. Uh, for example, another, a, a treatment for mal de ojo is to actually uh, rub an egg all over the back or your body to get the disease out of the body and into the egg. 
And what happens is that the curandero will then crack the egg into a cup and basically read the uh, egg to see what sort of disease you have and to show that it actually got out of your body. And this is something that uh, Zach can actually experience in his time in Ecuador. Um, other treatments include brujos, which is using witchcraft to sort of treat other witchcraft illnesses or yerbalistas, again, so herbs or teas, and also making herbs into sort of a, a, a brush or broom, and then you sort of, cleanse, uh, they would cleanse you by wiping it on your back. And so next slide, please. And so again, this table is just another bunch of magical plants used by curanderos or yerbalistas. Um, again, as you can see, it's you know, sort of brushing your body with the plant, rubbing your body with the plant, and, and again, different types of illnesses that can be cured, cured with these. And again, next slide. Sorry, there should, one, there should be one more place. Okay, thanks. And so what are some reasons for choosing traditional medicine over modern medicine? There's tradition, obviously, it's very deeply rooted in Andean indigenous cosmovision. Uh, and again, like I said earlier, there's a therapeutic benefit, especially with teas. And then there's also a reported efficacy, especially when modern medicine did not help. Suppose I suffer from stomach pain. The physician provides, prescribes me a pill, some syrup, oh, so many pills. The plants possess more effect than pills. Sometimes with a single plant, the pain is gone, despite all of these pills and syrups that the doctor prescribes, right? And there's also accessibility. A medical appointment with a physician costs 30 or 40 American dollars. If that's the case, then they prefer going to the traditional healer, which is gonna cost a significantly less amount of time, money. And also less amount of time because you, with the modern medicine, you also have to make an appointment, schedule an appointment, go to the appointment and maybe do some tests that you'd, you'd have to take a lot of time to actually travel to these clinics to get these things done. Uh, tourist attraction is also helping to pr provide a boost for traditional medicine. You know, tourists come into the country and they say, wow, this is really cool. And so unfortunately there's also the aspect of having a lot of traditional medicine pop up because of the tourism industry. And this may provide more access to traditional medicine, but unfortunately it also provides more access to, to scammers as well. Um, there's also disease conception. A physician can talk about disease, but never about energy. So if you're a medically trained physician, obviously you're gonna be talking about disease in a biological aspect. Uh, you're not gonna talk about that balance of energy, balance between the self, between nature and extra natural things. The physician is not gonna talk about that and it sort of shuts out these indigenous people, these rural people who, who believe in these ideas and who, and so they're, they're not gonna feel accepted from a physician who only talks about diseases in a biological sense. And in a healer patient relationship, sometimes physicians treat their patients despairingly, see them as peasants as such. This is obviously very unfortunate. Um, and they find that people who prefer, that people who do traditional medicine actually understand what they believe, what their beliefs are, and show more respect because of it. And a therapeutic model of misconceptions, you know, there's a large, we have, we probably have a large misconception about what traditional medicine is, as they, as do indigenous populations who have a large misconception as to what modern medicine is, as a lot of them think that modern medicine pills as such are synthetic drugs, man-made drugs, when uh, a lot of the a lot of the time that isn't the case, where it's just slightly modified natural chemicals found in the, probably even the same plants that they use for traditional medicine. Next slide, please. And there's also some drawbacks from using traditional medicine too. So one story that Dr. Carlos had told from from Fuguswam told us that. Um, you know, a lot of people tend to go to traditional medicine practitioners first. And so when they have some eye pain, they are given some eye drops by a curandero or whoever. And unfortunately that makes it a lot worse. And only after that gets worse, do they then seek out modern medicine. And by that time it may be too late or it may have caused a lot more problems than was necessary. Um, another one is as for childbirth, I've seen many unfair practices. For instance, if the child is transverse, meaning that the baby is not head first coming out, then the mother needs a C-section. Uh, but the healers try to accommodate this and the practice could cause a complication and the mother or child can die. There's also some poisoning aspects of, you know, not necessarily knowing what you take in from these and such. 
And so a potential solution to this is intercultural health communication collaboration. Pach is actually, uh, Fibu has already actually been implementing this on the ZAC where, you know, they go out in these caravanas and they have, treat people and see people, but there's also uh, Dr. Um, I, mean, I forget his name, unfortunately, but there's Dr. also Max. a, Dr. Max, correct. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Max also goes out into these caravanas and they he provides traditional medicine treatment and advice to these people and there is a and they say that the people love it and the, and that just gives more credibility uh, and a sense of uh well and a sense of belonging to the people that uh Pach sees um but the potential area for expansion could be increased collaboration with the local healers um and also just learning about traditional medicine too Thank you for that, Cody. And now moving on, I wanna just provide a view into how this indigenous population lives. And here on this slide, we have an example of the day in the life of a community member of this indigenous population. And given that most of them are rural and farmers, on the left, we can see that many of them wake up very early. They have a very simple breakfast and starting very early with the sunrise, they perform a lot of manual labor or heavy farm work up until lunchtime where they have lunch and a post-lunch nap called a siesta. And in the afternoon, the farm work becomes a bit more light and it consists mostly of harvesting, pruning, or applying certain pesticides. And they would do that until about 6 p.m. in the evening. And they'd have a very early dinner and an early wind down for bed. And the same goes for their children and many of the indigenous kids they'd wake up very early with their parents and commute to school starting oftentimes as early as five in the morning. And oftentimes without breakfast, school would start about six or seven o'clock in the morning. And a few hours after that, they'd have these snacks called colaciones, which are mid-morning snacks offered at certain schools. And for many children, these are their only source of food for the entire day because of an early dismissal without lunch and many times parents are not available to make lunch for them or during the morning they would be too busy to make breakfast and so in the afternoon and for the rest of the day it would consist mostly of homework or farm tasks if they're required to help out around the farm and during le leisure time they'd like to play some sports or go outdoors soccer would be a big pastime of theirs and here is a picture of Fibuspam actually in Riobamba and the surrounding areas just to provide a glimpse into where these communities are going to receive care and medical help. The next picture is actually the town of Alausi, which is also in the province of Chimborazo. And this just gives a good glimpse into the living conditions of um, these populations and these communities, you can see that many of these homes are pretty standard, um, although they do have electricity, most of them. Um, other, other resources that we take for granted um, might not be available to everyone. As is seen on this next slide as well, these are some farms, um, smaller farming communities on the outskirts of Riobamba. And these are located about four hours distance um, by walking from the clinic. And a lot of these patients do end up walking three to four hours to receive care because clinics and medical professionals aren't that available in these smaller communities. This is an example of a school that many kids would attend in the local area, also in the outskirts of Riobamba. And this is a pretty standard model for schools in um, these communities of Ecuador. And moving on, I'd like to talk about the diet, given that um, in the day to day, the nutrition uh, received by these people are, they, it could vary, but they're traditionally agricultures or farmers. And knowing that many of their foods actually consist of crops from the land and a lot of traditional and native animals, along with various imports as a result of modernization. But as for proteins, many would consume eggs, chicken um, on a more frequent basis. Guinea pig, or known as cuy, 
is reserved for ceremonial purposes and for special occasions, and sometimes beef or pork. As for vegetables, legumes, and tubers, you, they have your many types of corn, peas, various types of beans as well, which is a good source of protein, potatoes, quinoa, rice, amaranth, which is another grain similar to quinoa, and shikama. As for fruits, there's a large diversity of fruits within the Andean region. You have your avocado, your banana, your chili pepper, known as ahi, your babaco, the passion fruit, the guava, the blackberry, and the Martino blueberry, which you guys can see on the right, is a special type of blueberry that's native to that region. The naranjilla, which looks like a, a persimmon, it's that picture on the left. Um, that's actually very high in antioxidants and it's a very nutritious fruit, along with pepino melon, the taxo fruit, the tamarillo, the prickly pear, and the uvia. So these fruits are actually very nutritious for you, along with many of the native crops. As you can see, here are some quotes from our research that show that indigenous crops are actually more rich in fat and micronutrients. Their grains are a lot more healthy than simple carbs such as white bread or rice. And especially, I wanna focus on their fruits because they stand out for their high vitamin and micronutrient content. And in terms of nutrition, they have very high antioxidant activity. And this is very important in the prevention of various diseases and cancers and in relieving oxidative stress that the body may face from day-to-day -day activities and from exposure to the elements. Also, just as Cody has mentioned, the use of many plants and plant products and natural produce for nutritional purposes um, in terms of the traditional medicine sense is still very characteristic of this culture and is practiced daily. So vegetable and fruit consumption is quite common in, the, in these communities. And um, even though protein and that macronutrient consumption is very inconsistent, traditional indigenous produce has been shown to be more healthy and rich in micronutrients than certain crops that we may be more familiar with, such as rice um, or even bananas. Um, so many of these dietary components such as quinoa or even amaranth have been making stops in the Western markets as part of new trends in healthy eating. However, I wanna bring up this point where we have this table and this is the table of a result, the results of a community survey administered to various indigenous communities, as you can see on the top. And this basically shows that th there still exists a lot of food insecurity within these communities. And if we look at the various foods that are consumed, there's oil, rice, sugar, meat, fruits, eggs, juice, and milk, vegetables, corn, and potatoes. We see that a large percentage of these communities do consume their vegetables on a daily basis. However, in, in the reality, a lot of consumption consists of rice, sugars, oils, and soda. So the consumption of proteins like eggs and milk are actually decreasing, whereas the consumption of soda, um, sugar, and rice is actually on the increase. And all the way at the very bottom, we can see a section for outcomes that questions these populations about food insecurity, stunting, and overweight. And across the board, we can see that a large percentage of these communities do experience stunting and do experience high rates of overweight or obesity. And that is a sign of malnutrition. So the realities of their diet, even though they, it consists of many native crops and foods that are very nutritious, just under half of the respondents in this questionnaire report eating meat, um, less eat quinoa, fish, or eggs. And in comparison to indigenous populations of the Amazon, there's less access to protein because there, there are no rivers or even for communities on the coast, they have access to the ocean to fish, which is an important component of their diet. Whereas in the Andean region, they're landlocked and um, sources of protein are more scarce. So in terms of certain nutritional statistics and problems that these people face, they require more energy for their height and weight because they live very active lifestyles given the farm work 
or manual labor that they perform. Some statistics in particular um, are shown here in these points that I wanna make note of are that 58.2% of children were stunted in 1998. And over time, stats have varied due to shifting political climates. And, um, but for the most part, basically you can see that a large portion of these children are do experience stunting. And stunting and malnutrition have been shown to be results of food insecurity, a high disease burden, and various other socioeconomic factors. Um, as you can see here, the respondent to that questionnaire that we saw earlier um, are moms that likely had only an elementary school education and they earned less than minimum wage um, in that region, which is about $340 a month. And childhood nutrition is especially important for these communities or through for anyone because such nutritional deficiencies and the resulting problems can compound as a child grows and it can linger into adulthood if not addressed very early on. And here's a chart of stunting amongst children for the countries of Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia. And what I wanna point out here is we can see the curve of Ecuador Highland and Ecuador Other and there is a large discrepancy between the stunting curves for the indigenous or highland Ecuadorians and those the other Ecuadorians, which are Ecuadorians on the coast or Ecuador, Ecuadorians in the Orient or the jungle region. And that is very interesting because for the same socioeconomic status, the indigenous population of the Andes does experience a lot more childhood stunting. Um, this chart also reinforces that point where highlighted is for Ecuador, the indigenous population, 58.2% of children experience stunting. Here we see various charts of minerals um, in terms of iron, zinc, and calcium. And those straight lines that cut across these um, plots are the, uh, the recommended intake of iron, zinc, or calcium. And we can see that for zinc and calcium, there is a severe deficiency throughout across all ages. Whereas for iron, um, the deficiency grows over time as females and males both age. However, it's not as severe for zinc or calcium. Though this makes a point to show that there are uh, mineral deficiencies that exist amongst this population. And this next slide shows that, um, Sorry. This next slide shows the, the same for vitamins and for vitamin A, riboflavin and folate. And as we can see, the general trend is that as these children age, the deficiencies compound and grow larger. And iron, def iron deficiency can lead to anemia, which would be a severe problem for this population because this disease makes it more difficult to transport oxygen throughout the body. And these communities already exist and they live in an environment where atmospheric oxygen is already lower than at sea level. So that would result in um, greater difficulties in accomplishing daily tasks and the manual labor. Vitamin B12 deficiency also adds to anemia. Um, they have low intakes of protein and animal foods. So this is also expected. And this deficiency may also lead to nerve damage and a decrease in nervous system function. Zinc deficiencies can lead to poor growth amongst children, poor cognitive development, and poor immune function. Um, on this slide, we see that in a study, children receive less than 20% of their energy from fats. And fats are important because healthy fats and fatty acids that are derived from animal sources and from eggs, um, they're very important in the absorption of various micronutrients and vitamins that may come from the fruits and vegetables that they eat. So even though these populations and these children eat a lot of fruits and vegetables on a daily basis, fats are required for their absorption, the, the various micronutrients that do come with them. So malnutrition is a very prevalent problem amongst this community. And when we think of malnutrition, we tend to think of a child or a person that's very, very skinny, that lacks a lot of food, However, it's a double-edged sword in reality. Um, you, on one hand, you can have overnutrition, 
where you consume too much of the wrong nutrients or too much of one, um, a very high caloric intake without very high nutritional value. And on the other hand, you have your stereotypically malnourished um, ch child, which would be someone who's very skinny, someone who hasn't eaten much, and someone who needs to eat more. So the reason for this uptick in malnutrition amongst this population is because of this phenomenon known as the nutrition transition. So this is a phenomenon that occurs when a country becomes more industrialized, as Ecuador is in the process of doing. And through this, various social and economic factors cause a shift in the lifestyle and therefore the, cons the food consumption of a traditionally rural population, such as the Andean Quechua. So basically, many effects that have be been a result of this nutrition transition have been that urbanization has led to kids rejecting traditional homemade meals, um, hence the decrease in the consumption of traditional crops, grains, and fruits, and parents not really preparing cooked meals. So what ends up happening is that many of these families turn to fast processed foods. And families also have more disposable income to spend on foods such as soda, sausages, noodles, or fried foods. And traditional farming practices along with traditional family roles have also taken a shift. So this is a chart that basically puts into a picture what the nutrition transition is. And in Ecuador, they call this desculturalización, which is a loss of their, their inherent cultural identity. And a big part of that is because of the loss of the farming lifestyle into an urban lifestyle where both members of the household would work and there'd be very poor meal timing for both parents and children. Here we see more results of this nutrition transition. As I said before, mothers find it easier to cook. Um, what I find really important is in that, in this quote the, from a study is that higher income reap from high intensity, high input farming of non-traditional crops, which means that farmers turn to more, more cash crops. Um, it's actually associated with worse nutritional outcomes, which is surprising because these families make more money um, they grow more food, there's more production. However, the food is less nutritious and this disposable income a lot, along with this cultural transition actually leads to poorer childhood health outcomes like growth. Um, following that is a quote from a grandmother in a focus group that talks about how there's, a, there's very much a loss of tradition in terms of what the children choose to eat and from the traditional roles because this population is a very traditional people and women tend to be domestic caregivers who have the primary task of cooking and preparing meals for the whole family. However, as this transition occurs, more of them turn to work in the industrial sectors and foods prepared with more traditional grains that would be more nutritious are um, actually replaced by processed foods that are bought. And here I want to highlight a table that was from a survey that sh questioned mothers about good nutrition. And this percentage, 71.58%, actually shows that 71.58% of these mothers surveyed do not, were not educated on good nutrition. Um, and same thing about nutrition and exercise, that combination, uh, almost 16% were not educated on the combination and the importance of those two factors. So many factors for food choices in these communities um, consist of basically the environment and the agriculture. Um, farmers find it easier to plant crash crops, less nutritious and less traditional crops. Their history or tradition that's been eroded by this urbanization. Um, the family lifestyle um, in terms of many families becoming more urban, parents working in cities, this is very influential. This has a large impact in the food choices. And because of this lack of nutritional education, many just eat like those around them. And thus, these are the greatest determinants of this ongoing problem of malnutrition within this indigenous population. Um, I believe we're moving on to mental health now. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, mental health in the Ecuadorian context. So I'll begin by noting that information on mental health of indigenous peoples of Ecuador is scarce. There's very few population-wide surveys or diagnostics that have been made. I'll make sure to cover why that is the case and why mental health is a dire issue in Ecuador, especially amongst indigenous communities. And many of you will be able to do for yourself that because of the socioeconomic, overall health and systemic factors that inhibit indigenous Ecuadorians, the rates of mental illness are alarmingly high and their overall mental health is poor. So moving on, we have um, risk factors for indigenous populations, which uh, especially affect uh, those in the Andes, uh, being life, lower life expectancy, high infant and child mortality. So over one in five children die prematurely, high maternal morbidity, cardiovascular disease, malnutrition, extreme poverty. There are indigenous communities in the, uh, in the, in the Andean highlands are 60% below the poverty threshold compared to a national average of 21%. Uh, lower education, depression, substance abuse, chronic diseases, infectious diseases, that can go on for an hour. If we move on and couple these with a uh, longstanding history of systemic and colonial oppression, it's only a recipe for disaster. That and the fact that ind indigenous communities are prone to marginalization, disruption of their cultural continuity and sense of autonomy only makes matters worse. To confirm this in 2005, the Ibero-American Meeting on the Rights of Indigenous Children and Adolescents, UNICEF's Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean stated that 88% to 95% of indigenous peoples throughout Latin America continue to live in exclusion. This means that they lack basic public goods and services, for example, proper police force, firefighters, ambulances, electricity, clean drinking water, basic health care, et cetera. So moving on, uh, where does mental health care infrastructure stand in Ecuador, especially within indigenous communities? Well, if we take a look at the urban areas, for every 100,000 inhabitants, there are eight mental health professionals, and three of those are trained psychiatrists, which isn't a lot compared to other developing countries and especially developed countries. If we look at the United States and Canada, we're already missing mental health professionals and we have quite, we have significantly more for every 100,000 inhabitants. So that kind of puts things into perspective. What makes matters worse is there's virtually no psychologists, social workers, or the like in primary and secondary schools. This is despite the fact that nearly 35% of all patients checked into a psych ward at a general hospital are below the age of 17. In some, mental health uh, is an aspect of health and well-being that's completely disregarded in Ecuador, and this is uh, especially the case for indigenous people. Uh, why? Well, if we move on to the next slide, we see that regional uh, governments neglect their mental health needs and exclude them from conventional Western health services. This, um, Two, there are approximately 5 million Quechua indigenous peoples living in the Andes, and there are virtually no psychiatric services offered. Three, in Ecuador, as of right now, there are in and around five Quechua speaking physicians, and only one is a psychiatrist, and I don't even think he practices in Ecuador. Uh, four, uh, no culturally sensitive health services offered in the Quechua language. Five, uh, the doctor Quechua patient communication is inadequate, and often interactions are loaded with prejudice. These factors have created a reluctance by Quechua members to want services from Western health providers and a prevent, uh, preference for traditional healers. This come, becomes problematic in that traditional healers can only help so much. They can alleviate psych psychological stress by talking to the patients, but there's still, as anyone knows from taking a basic psychology class, you need both therapeutic inter intervention and medicine for uh, for the intervention or for the recovery of the patient to be the best and reduce relapse. So introducing medication like antidepressants, anti-anxiety, antipsychotics is necessary. So if we move on to depression rates, there was a survey-based study conducted by USIM et al. in 2009 using the Spanish version of the Beck Depression Inventory 2. Uh, and they basically sought to, uh, to measure levels of depression within an, within an indigenous Andean community located in the Zamora Chinchipe province. Um, Yusimiol uh, administered the, the test to 167 patients, 96 were women, 71 were men, and they demonstrated alarming rates of severe and moderate depression hovering around 32 and 28% respectively. 
uh, with approximately 15% of those patients having also mild depression, for a total of 75% suffering from a certain degree uh, of depression. It's important to note that in Latin America, the perception of neurological disorders is quite different from the Western world. And UCMAL took that in consideration. They basically explained that in Latin America, depression is frequently observed or manifested through somatic systems, such as headaches, gastrointestinal disturbances, or complaints of nervios, uh, meaning nerves in Spanish, rather than psychological sy symptoms such as sadness or guiltness. So uh, guilt, uh, guilt. So considering that they took the cultural context into consideration and that the BDP2 is, a, is an accurate battery for testing or surveying depression rates, uh, we can kind of deduce that the rates that they the rates of depression are relatively accurate. And considering that, as we will see with anxiety rates, considering that this is occurring from one region to the next and from one Andean uh, community to the next, uh, the likelihood that these depression rates are also in other communities is relatively high. So if we move on to anxiety rates, according to the World Health Organization, the most common mental disorders seen or treated in psychiatric departments in Ecuador are schizophrenia and anxiety. Anxiety in its most severe cases can be debilitating either via panic attacks, avoidance behaviors, et cetera. What is most problematic is that there's usually high rates of comorbidity between anxiety and depression. This is especially true for those with severe, who, who experience severe symptoms for both depression and anxiety, which often results in poor prognostics for recovery. Uh, in other words, chronicity and greater rates of re relapse. Uh, if we move on, we see that According to Maneka and all, there's multiple studies in a range of settings that have found increased rates of suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, and completed suicide in cases with comor comorbid anxiety and depression compared to those with a single disorder. So the likelihood that a significant amount of those individuals within the Simeol study also have anxiety uh, is high, especially for those with severe depression. And if we extend it, like I said before, to a wider population of Ecuador, the plausibility that a significant population is suffering from depression, anxiety, or both is high. Continue, we are then faced uh, with the grim reality and the pattern seen across the globe where suicide rates in indigenous communities are relatively high compared to the national slash global average, anywhere from zero to 19 suicide deaths per 100,000 inhabitants with a margin of anywhere from zero to 20 times that of non-indigenous populations. To put into perspective, Ecuadorian provinces with higher elevation, so in, in other words, those in the Andes experience a suicide rate of nine for every 100,000 inhabitants which is double those at sea level. So to put into perspective, five, there's 5 million Quechua speaking members in the Andean highlands. If we divide that by 100,000, that comes out to 50, multiply that by nine, that's almost 450 people every year that are taking their own lives. And last but not least, schizophrenia rates. So it's unclear amongst indigenous populations, but given that the World Health Organization deduced that it's one of the most common, uh, that and anxiety is the most common uh, disorders seen in psychiatric departments. Uh, we can do that it's, if it's relatively high in urban areas, it's also gonna be relatively high in indigenous uh, communities. The reason for that is schizophrenia is highly heritable. There's estimates of 79% heritability and it's extremely related to gen genetic factors, but the schizophrenia gene works uh, sort of in mysterious ways. It's You can get the gene, you can have it, but it remain dormant, it needs to be turned on. And the way that happens is usually from non-genetic factors, so environmental risks like substance abuse, childhood trauma, pregnancy, social isolation, social exclusion, uh, discrimination, et cetera. These by themselves or in combination can lead to the gene turning on as they, uh, as they persist over time. So take into account that uh, Indigenous people might or might not have the gene. And secondly, that they're very much exposed to uh, these non-genetic environment and environmental risks. The possibility of schizophrenia rates being alarmingly high amongst indigenous population uh, is there. So the risk is, is truly there. 
So each of my peers have talked about the different challenges the indigenous population faces when it comes to their daily life, including the discuss discussion of two specific health related services related to accessing traditional medicine and mental health. However, I want to talk more about when the indigenous population decides to seek medical help from modern medicine as a whole, they face racism in many aspects which impact their well being. There are different factors which contribute to the discrimination the indigenous population faces in the healthcare setting. One factor is that there are layers of social inequalities persistent. This includes how the indigenous, low income, and rural households are all limited in their ability to access healthcare services. And with the indigenous population who could fall into all three categories, they're the ones who are least likely to be able to access healthcare services. However, even when the indigenous population is able to access these services, they face further discrimination by non-indigenous healthcare personnel Indigenous people are afraid of hospitals and the health system because historically they have been discriminated against by doctors, nurses, and exploited by pharmacies. Indigenous people face other barriers, including difficult communication between modern healthcare providers and Indigenous patients, linguistic barriers, and different perceptions of health and illness between Indigenous and Western healthcare providers. Now, specifically what the indigenous population themselves believe is causing this gap between the indigenous population and non-indigenous healthcare providers are a variety of different things. The first being that the relationship between the two has an imbalance of power. From one study that conducted qualitative interviews with indigenous patients, they said that physicians are seen as arrogant people that are incapable of understanding what the indigenous traditional healer can contribute because of their lack of knowledge of ancestral medicine and skills and that physicians criticize the work that traditional healers do for the improvement of the community. Additionally, in the same study, the indigenous population believed that the hospital appears as a hostile environment, both for a healer and for a patient. It's seen as a place where patients are not cared properly, which makes them embarrassed, humiliated, and afraid of being mistreated. The indigenous population wants to feel accepted and respected by non-indigenous healthcare providers. Here, acceptance is understood in several different ways. One is the acceptance of their own diseases, their own understanding of health and illness, and their entire worldview. On the other hand, there is acceptance of the traditional healer's existence and their role in society. Also, it feels like to them that the non-Indigenous healthcare staff seems to be very restricted to the epistemological framework that they learned at university. Now, um, a lot of what I've been talking about isn't something that happened in the past to Indigenous people. And it is, in fact, happening now as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to unfold in the Chimborazo province. To give a quick overview of the impact of COVID-19 to the Indigenous population, during the course of the pandemic, in the language of the government and authorities, the delivery of kits, foods, hand sanitizer, and masks was understood as aids they gave to the Indigenous community. However, in the logic of Andean reciprocity, those who receive this type of aid are obliged to express gratitude. So what was supposed to help as a gift now becomes a perceived debt that requires to be paid off over time. Also, the aid did not reach all communities, with testimony stating that the food rations from the government and mayor's office reached the communities of the lower part that in the elections voted for them. The high altitude communities did not receive the support. And this was something that caused unrest among the communities and their leaders. In addition to the, all these current problems, we go back to how the discrimination of the indigenous population in the healthcare setting is still prevalent. Specifically, Andean indigenous people were berated by healthcare professionals for catching COVID-19 because of their traditional lifestyles and were even refused treatment. According to one Andean indigenous person's testimony, doctors and nurses, they were being, they were creating guilt complexes. They said that last year when they were hospitalized, they told them they contracted the COVID-19 virus from being unclean because of their lifestyle. Similar to this testimony, another Andean indigenous person stated that when we took my uncle to the hospital with a lot of cough, they did not want to receive him saying, you Indians get sick from being untidy, living and reproducing like guinea pigs, being deaf and badly obedient. If you want, turn on the radio to find out about the danger of the virus. Thus, we had to go back and wait for my uncle to pass away. As a whole, the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador on their website has called out the Ecuadorian government for not taking culturally appropriate prevention initiatives for Indigenous people during this pandemic. 
For example, the tests of COVID-19 that are carried out are insufficient and the diagnosed patients are not followed up. Epidemiological barriers are virtually non-existent and healthcare centers are devoid of essential supplies, medicine, and medical personnel to attend to the emergency. Now, in order to help bridge the healthcare gap between the indigenous population and non-indigenous healthcare providers, there are two select solutions that are presented that are grounded in literature. The first is a model the government created called the Model of Integrated Attention of a National Health System Dash Family Community and Intercultural Model, acronym of MACE Dash FCI, which was created in 2012. This model is grounded in the recognition that the modern biomedical approach is unable to fully understand, respect, and incorporate the ancestral knowledge and practice necessary to facilitate healthcare access to all Ecuadorians. Now, what this model does is establish local health teams composed of health professionals and technicians in primary health care. These technicians are local residents with two years of training who serve as health promoters and intermediaries between public health professionals and the local population. In predominantly indigenous areas, the technicians speak the indigenous language and are familiar with cultural components of health beliefs and practices. Also, the model requires that health facilities provide culturally appropriate services and installations like birthing rooms that respond to cultural preferences. For Botch and Fubus Fam, it would be interesting to see if staff at Fubus Fam could be trained to be technicians in primary healthcare or if technicians could be added to the staff because it would be very beneficial to the local indigenous community. The second solution is related to the incorporation of formal training. Unfortunately, public health professionals in Ecuador receive little formal training in culturally informed health beliefs and practices and few speak indigenous languages. Additionally, they often work under pressure and may not be able to spend the necessary time to develop the interpersonal relationships that are so important to indigenous patients. So this is not as structured as the training for technicians in primary healthcare, but some version of formal training could be needed for non-indigenous healthcare providers to provide culturally appropriate services. For Botch and Fubus Fam, this would include connecting one Indigenous healthcare provider with a non-Indigenous healthcare provider to facilitate the start of a partnership, either on Zoom or in person, or organizing a workshop to have an Indigenous provider trade multiple non-Indigenous providers in a group setting on how to deliver healthcare services that reflect local health cultures and that are culturally appropriate. Now that brings us to the conclusion of our presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you guys, that, that was, uh, thank you very much. That was very impressive. And uh, I, yeah, I commend you for all of the effort that you guys put into this. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd like to point out that, you know, like that very end, I mean, that's something that we could, we should be continuing the conversation on, on the fact that FIBU spam, I mean, it, from my perspective has really been leading the way in bridging that gap. And uh, you know, what you pointed out is something that just popped into my head is, Perhaps this is something that we that can go beyond fee spam to other healthcare providers throughout the country and throughout the Andes. Um, it's you know something to, something that we can consider. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I believe uh, I see Sarah has her hand up, and uh, we'll call on her. Um. Well, first of all, just wow, guys. Wow, this is great. I think this is probably the best presentation that I've attended all year, seriously. And, you know, having worked in Ecuador for so very long, I learned a lot. You, you did just such a great job of synthesizing data and picking different areas to discuss. I am just so, so impressed and um, I'm glad we recorded this presentation. I know we're gonna be able to use it again and again to help orient people to our patient base, to um, to uh, sort of what, what new volunteers are getting themselves into. And I can't believe that having never stepped into Ecuador, you were able to get the context head on and, and just really nail it. So, so congratulations. This was this was fantastic. I'm so glad that I was able to listen in today. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as we wrap this up, uh, was there anything oh, that you guys, you know, felt that you know? I mean, obviously, this was all brand new to you. 
Um, but is there anything that just really struck you that just like is sticking with you and perhaps you want to, you know, you to talk about in the future or look into in the future or anything that we could support you on with any questions that arose from your um, research and as you put this together? If there isn't, I mean, just well, just to let you know, we're always here for you for any anything that you know might be piquing your interest that could you know be something that you might study or looking and in, look into in your future uh, careers and studies. But uh, you know, I I actually you know just like Sarah, I you know I've I've been going down to Ecuador since you know 2002, and it's uh it's you know I I've I've learned <laughs> I've learned a lot today, and. Uh, yeah, and one thing that really, you know, just an example, something that really stuck with me was at the beginning of the presentation, um, when talking about one, if like in the family, if one person's sick, it affects the entire family. And, you know, that just, you know, just shows like kind of a ripple effect of, of certain illnesses and, um, and those, you know, it's not just one person, it's, it's everybody that, that gets affected by it. So, that that is you know that just brings the importance of healthcare that um, you know healthcare outreach you know and, and uh, that just really highlights that so um, so yeah thank you guys very much for for this this was extremely impressive and uh, I look forward to uh, the rest of them and, uh, if there's you know if you guys have anything else you'd like to share please feel free or otherwise uh, thank you very much and we'll wrap this up. I have one more comment, Zach. I just wanted yeah. everyone to know who the other folks were on the oh, call. Yeah. We have Janice German with us now, who's one of our board members um, from HAT. And Janice, thank you so much for being with us. And Annie Lester, um, I think that's how you pronounce her last name, was always with us, was also with us for um, the majority of the time. And she runs the Princeton and Latin America program. She's the director of Princeton and Latin America. It's sort of like, I would compare it to a mini Peace Corps. Um, Patch also partners with them. And I know she was really interested in attending the presentation as well. So I'm glad we got to share um, your work with, with some guests today. Great, well, thank yeah, you. I'll, I'll oh, just sorry. quickly echo Sarah's comments. This was really great. Um, very informative. I've been down there twice for volunteers and, and I learned a lot and um, appreciate. I actually jotted down several questions during my the course of it and you answered all of them, which was great. And so um, you guys were really thorough and I wish you all the best and hope to maybe see you in Ecuador someday. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. Thank you guys. Yeah, yeah. Thank thanks you. for tuning in. Thanks. Bye-bye.